Well, let's look at these scriptures. John chapter 2, verses 23 to 25. Now, while he, that's Jesus, was in Jerusalem at the Passover feast, many people saw the miraculous signs he was doing and believed in his name. But Jesus would not entrust himself to them, for he knew all men. He did not need man's testimony about man, for he knew what was in man. Okay, let's break this passage down because I had to go through this a couple of times. So here's Jesus. He's teaching. He's got a bunch of people who believe in his miraculous signs he, and believed in his name. It sounds like the beginning of a church. But Jesus says, sorry. He did not commit himself to their response. He didn't say you can be my disciples. He knew that they were not sincere or the sincerity would not last. Their commitment to him would fizzle out. In order for him to know that, he had to have... Foreknowledge. Foreknowledge, future yes. knowledge of what mm -hmm. they were going to do or not do. So yes. Jesus, in his foreknowledge or future knowledge, decided, I'm not going to allow these to be my disciples. Yes. They're there are, excited now, but it's going to fizzle out. There are some teachers that say, when it says that God has foreknowledge of us, it just means he foreknows that we will exist. But this verse is showing it goes beyond that. It's not just that he foreknow, foreknows a person's existence. He foreknows a person's future decisions the details of, that are part of that person's existence. So it's, a, it's an expanded understanding of and foreknowledge. This concept took me a while to grasp, but now that I've grasped it, it has blown me away. And I want to give just a kind of a simple example yes. of what this means in God's foreknowledge, because his foreknowledge allows him not only to set certain events into action, which will impact others, but he allows it on a far greater scale. Yes. I want to give an example of uh, Debbie and I when we were beginning to leave the Phoenix, Arizona area. Mm -hmm. God, in his knowledge, knew what was going to happen. I want to go through those steps. Let's look at a graph yes. right here. Mm -hmm. Debbie and I left Phoenix, Arizona, moved here to Virginia, located a certain area, met certain people, and poured our lives into certain people. God knew whom we were going to touch before we even moved. So I, I want to walk through these steps. Yes. Number one... <clears throat> God, we had to move somewhere. We could have chosen, uh, because we were moving ourselves and uh, linking with, at that time, ACMC, we could have chosen to have located anywhere in the United States. So mm -hmm. Debbie and I looked at each other and said, where do you want to live? We thought, maybe California, maybe we'd go to Colorado, maybe we'd go to Alabama, where she lived, maybe we'd go to Atlanta, we've heard of that, or uh, we thought of Virginia, because we both liked Virginia. For various reasons, we chose the Richmond, Virginia area. My mom was going to be living with us. It was rich in, in uh, history, and we homeschooled all of our kids. So he knew eventually we were going to choose Richmond. Mm -hmm. But from there... <clears throat> Just like a tree branches, exactly. sends a branch this way as opposed to a different way. Exactly. <laughs> and then after deciding where we're going to move, the question was, what house are we going to live in? <clears throat> where are we going to live in the Richmond area? Could we're going to live on the south side? Would we be in the north side? Would we be in the Glen Allen? Would we be in Hanover? Would we be in uh, the far west end? Where were we going to live? Well, God knew that we were going to choose a house approximately 15 minutes away from the airport that would locate us in what's now called Mechanicsville, where we are. So he knew that choice was going to be made. And this is all before we even moved. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> then he knew which house we were going to live in. Were we going to buy a small house in a small part of uh, land? Were we going to buy large house in a certain area? Would it have acreage? Would it not? What would we be able to do in the future with that area? Well, he knew we'd be choosing this house that had acreage that would allow us to eventually build this studio. Yes. God knew that before we even left Arizona. And then the question was, which church are we going to attend? Once we lived in Mechanicsville, there were five or six different churches that we could choose from. He knew we were going to choose this certain church, so we chose that church. From there, the question was, who are we going to pour our lives into? What kind of people are we going to influence? And God knew in, we could pour our lives into multiple people, but he knew that we would be focusing in on a few, and he knew I would be touching one certain man by the name of Russ Nash. Now, Russ Nash has had a huge impact by my pouring my life into him, and it's affected his family, it's affected his marriage. And now what Russ has done, Russ has gone around and taught others. 
And from that one little leaf, out of the <coughs> hundreds of thousands of options, had we moved to California, lived a certain area, chose a certain church, and poured our lives into a few people, out of those hundreds of thousands of options, he knew five years down the road we'd be impacting these certain people. So in the illustration of the tree, hypothetically, you could have ended up here or here. Or correct, here. correct. But God foreknew this the line. The every branching. little branch, every tree trunk has branches off of it, have that, and he knew which one leaf yes. we would be choosing. And then that one leaf, that person, has thousands of options themselves. Mm -hmm. And he knew Russ would be pouring his life into certain people and that those people would be impacted and they would be impacting other people and those people would be turning around and impacting others and those would be turning around and... And so when you think of the sovereignty of God and all the future possibilities that are out there and God knows them all, yes. it's staggering. Yes. Staggering to see the sovereignty of God. The depth and width and height of his omniscience. Yes. Now, let's begin to look at John chapter 6, verse 44, and begin yes. to tie a lot of this together. Yes. John chapter 6, verse 44. Jesus said, No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up at the last day. Those are key words, draws him. Yes. There's two types of drawings that you have taught me. Let's talk about those. There's an irresistible drawing and a resistible drawing. Okay, let's talk about the irresistible drawing. Let's talk about this water bottle. Yes. If I pick something up and pull it, it has no power to resist me. I overcome the, the, its mass and the force of gravity. And So this water bottle has no option but to be drawn to me because yes. I want it. I want to drink from it. it. It just can't. And we have no option but to be drawn toward the center of the earth by the force of gravity. That's an irresistible drawing. Mm -hmm. The other kind of drawing is when a man woos a young woman that he's in love with and wants to marry, she has the option to resist his wooing, to resist his uh, appeal to her. Or you may say to your dog, come, and your dog doesn't get up and come. He just re refuses. Usually he does. It's the cat that doesn't come. It's the cat that probably <laughs> is more resisting. So, so two types of drawing, yes. one that is resistible, one that isn't. The one that mm -hmm. isn't, like picking up the water bottle, that can't be resisted, but trying to woo somebody, trying to draw someone, mm -hmm. trying to court your wife, you want to court them, you're trying to draw them close to you, you do it by sending flowers, you do it by writing nice notes, mm -hmm. nice emails, nice texts, nice whatever, yes. and you're trying to draw them to yourselves, but that person has the option to say no, whereas the water bottle doesn't. That's right. And then the, <clears throat> there's, there are various illustrations of this. I like the one that you used that your wife, Debbie, had a way of uh, influencing the free will of your children. Yeah, when Debbie and when the kids were small, when our kids were <coughs> small and they were holding something they shouldn't hold and Debbie, her, her you know, eyes went wide, what are they doing holding that? But they're holding onto it firmly and they really like it. She says, well, what am I going to do? And she uses the put off, put on principle. She grabs something they know they'll like more and she dangles it in front of them and they dropped what they shouldn't be holding and grabbed what was safe. Mm -hmm. And so they, in their free will, exercise their free will. But Debbie was totally in charge. So the point there is that even when the child is resisting the command to let go of something that might be dangerous to the child, there is, it's possible to induce the child to exercise his or her free will because the child wants something else, so the child says no to the thing that originally it thought it wanted more. So it's an influential power that my yes. wife had over the children by dangling <coughs> something more that they yes. wanted. Now we can expand from that into what I like to call directive encompassment. Just as your wife Debbie had control over are there things in the household that she could put in front of a child to interest that child in letting go of the thing that was not in the child's best interest. God has control of all the forces of nature, all the decisions that uh, other people will make that are going to influence us, and he can orchestrate thousands of things, hundreds of thousands of things, maybe millions of things in our surroundings that cause us to exercise our free will in the way that will best serve his future purposes. He's not violating our free will. He's influencing it by means of external 
persuasions. Now, why the words directive and encompassment? Because all of these persuasions encompass us. We can't get away okay, from them. Okay, gotcha. And they direct us to do something. And God exploits them to direct us to ultimately repent of our sins, believe on Jesus. Now, not everyone can be directed. There are some people who, of their own free will, set what I'm going to call their threshold of submission so high that when God does a, the equivalent of a computer scan to see if there's any possible set of earthly circumstances that he could arrange to bring this person to that high threshold of submission, everything fails. No matter what God does in the context of this world, and that there are limitations in this world, that person, even when the most profound persuasions are brought to bear, will still say no and remain hardened and obdurate and stubborn and rejecting of God's influence to the end of his or her life. To illustrate that, I lived out in the tropics and there are a lot of monkeys in most areas of the tropics. And monkey hunters have a way of catching a monkey, which is very efficient. They'll put a cage and inside the cage, they will put a, a fruit that they know the certain species of monkeys, monkey desires. In order to get that fruit out of the cage, the monkey has to make his hand small, insert his hand, grab onto the fruit, and, but the problem is when the monkey is holding onto the fruit, he can't pull his hand back out. Because the fruit in the hand are bigger than the Bigger bars. than the opening, mm -hmm. yes. So the monkey hunter is waiting, hiding behind some bushes. When he sees the monkey has closed his little fingers on that fruit, he comes out and walks toward the monkey with a club. The <laughs> monkey sees him coming. And he has the option of letting go of that fruit and pulling his hand out and fleeing, in which case the monkey hunter will not have monkey meat for dinner. But the monkey, this particular species of monkey, is so determined not to give up that fruit. He will keep his, it in his clutches, and the hunter comes up and clubs him on the head, and to the end, that monkey will not let go of that fruit. He'd rather die than let go. Wow. Well... God is not a monkey hunter, but I use the illustration to point out that in the human scene, there are people, the pharaoh types, who no matter what, even if God would practically rearrange the solar system to persuade them, they'll still say no. They'll still harden their heart. And God knows that that is a potential in this world. Evil has the potential to be that obdurate. And so God in his scan, a computer scan, you use the words a computer scan, God uh, as a <clears throat> omniscient computer mm -hmm. scanning all the possible options that there are in a person's life begins to arrange future circumstances based yes. on the branches that have been chosen, that will be chosen, et cetera, et cetera, future <coughs> circumstances that a person will choose to get them to do what he wants, what's best for them out of his love for them. And if he doesn't find an effective let me say, a foreknown effective set of persuasions, then he regards that person as non-elect. So that would, that's how we define elect versus non-elect. Non -elect. elect are those whom God knows in his future knowledge what circumstances could be arraigned in their life that they would then humbly repent before God, uh, seek the Creator, and say, please forgive me. He sees there's no way he can persuade them and he's not going to violate their free will and force them to choose him. That would be the non-elect. Well, it, that would be a violation of, God, of free will. I understand, and, right, right. Because God wants free will because only free will can give genuine love that we were talking about, remember? So, mm -hmm. it ha so free will must not be violated. So then he sees, I could do this for them. I could arrange this. I could time these disappointments, these a loss of a job or a sickness. Nothing is going to work on the basis of God's foreknowledge that that person is going to be like the monkey and not release his stubbornness, let go of his stubborn decisions. God says, I'm sorry, you're not elect. I'm not even going to bother arranging special persuasions because I foreknow none of them will be effective. 
But then God sees other people and he sees, aha, here's Job. Right now he's sinning, is not in any way turning to me. People are appealing to him and he's rejecting all their pleas. However, let me look into Job's future. And God says, aha, if I arrange that the plumbing will start leaking on a certain day and he is fired from his job on the same day and uh, he comes home and his wife isn't there and it's his birthday and he thinks he's forgotten his birthday, these and other grievous things will bring him to the end of himself and he will feel so in need of help and it seems like there is just no way that in his he's own gonna power, get, he can do it. He can do it in his own power and it doesn't seem any source of human help. Then and then only will Joe look beyond for God's help and will actually pray to God and say, oh God, I need your help. And I can't ask for your help without repenting of the way I've been. So I repent, please, I cast myself in your mercy. I need your help. God foreknows that. God also foreknows unless he brings all those specific circumstances to bear upon Job, Job at the foreknown moment, Job will be lost forever. Which he doesn't want. And God doesn't want him God to be lost. God wants all men to be saved. So whereas let's call the other guy Zach. Zach is non-elect because of his own free will, Zach has chosen to put his threshold of submission beyond the reach of any persuasions that God could uh, for ordain in this life. But Joe is elect because God foreknows if he arranged, and he in his mercy and his foreknowledge and his compassion for Joe, arrange a persuasive set of circumstances, Joe will be redeemed. Now, and God guarantees because of his potential repentance, he will be saved. 